everybody to the AIQM Lecture Series. Uh, I'm Jean Spayers. I'm just here to welcome and introduce uh, Nicola Waters from uh, Thomas Rivers University. Nicola has uh, extraordinary experience in word-related uh, clinical practice, education, industry and research. So at the moment she's an Associate Professor in the School of Nursing at Thompson Rivers University in Kamloops. Uh, she has a Master's in Science in Wound Healing and Tissue Repair from Cardiff University and she completed her PhD at the University of Calgary using institutional ethnography. Um, so welcome Nicola. Thank you. Uh, the focus of your talk today is explaining institutional ethnography and reading your questions um, for committee members, uh, for graduate students. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So yes, Nicola Waters, and how many of you here are either currently using institutional ethnography or thinking of using it or having a student that is using it? Okay, fair number, that's good to know. All right, so what I'm really going to talk about is answering and a asking graduate committee questions. So my objectives here are to outline the philosophical underpinnings of institutional ethnography to describe how these inform the way health research is conducted and to discuss common questions that present challenges when trying to fit institutional ethnography into the requirements of a graduate program. So for, and it, it does seem that most people here are very familiar with um, institutional ethnography. So it's um, Dor Dorothy Smith, um, of course, uh, developed this as a method of inquiry uh, to explore the social organization of knowledge as a way to make visible how people's lives are coordinated and regulated by institutions. And what is unique about um, institutional ethnography, or at least what differentiates it from many other qualitative methods, is that it doesn't begin in and or generate theory. Smith draws on uh, uh, the roots of institutional ethnography from uh, Marxist materialism, from Garfinkel's ethno methodology, and from feminist consciousness raising. And what each of these have in common is that in, in different ways they all ground inquiry in the ongoing activities of actual individuals. So in institutional ethnography, one of the underpinnings is that work is defined as anything or everything that people do that is intended involves time and effort and is done in a particular time and place and under definite local conditions. So in this picture here, for example, if I was observing a nurse and a patient in a hospital setting or in a clinic setting, which is uh, what I did as, as part of my study, and I'll explain more about that as I go through, in this situation, we're not just seeing the nurse that's working as somebody that's being comp compensated financially for being there, but the patient too is, is doing the work of being a patient in that setting. So the work of sitting in the waiting room and waiting, the work of presenting themselves in a way that uh, explains what it is that's going on for them. All of these are considered to be work in institutional ethnography. So ideas and concepts are produced through and not independent of people's activities. The other thing that happens in this situation is that it's not happening in isolation of other things that are happening around uh, within an institutional organization. So this patient has come from somewhere and they're going to somewhere. And depending on where they've come from and where they're going to is a, is a sequence of events that certain things are put into, into uh, this sequence and the information that is passed along will change the outcome of what happens as somebody is progressing through a set of social relations. So, as I said, everything is always happening in relation to somebody else and not just in isolation. And this becomes quite complex because in today's organizations, we have all many different layers, many different levels of organization that are happening. So, again, if we're looking at what happens here at the ground level, these people are connected in different ways to the institution, so whichever health region, whichever organization uh, the work is taking place within. We've got uh, the discourse of health healthcare within Canada and up to governmental level where we've got 
the state organization, which of course is very related to funding. We've got health acts, we've got um, leg legal um, discourse and all of the things that we have to follow, all of the rules and regulations and the policies that are organizing how the work happens at the front line. So the aim of institutional ethnography is to investigate how work is organized for particular people within a certain set of social relations. And the aim is to discover and map how individuals' work is hooked into inst institutional processes and interconnections that coordinate, govern, and constrain their work, often without their knowledge. So oftentimes people are working at the front line of practice and they're not aware of all those different layers that are happening around them that, that they're linked into. And this is becoming more and more complex in today's society. It used to be relatively easy to be able to identify who was the head of an organization, where ideas and concepts and theories were coming from, and how they were filtering down into the front line of an organization. As we move into more centralization of services, we have standardization of processes that happen locally, they happen provincially, oftentimes they happen nationally, sometimes they even happen internationally. It's coming, becoming much more difficult to be able to understand where the concepts and ideas that we're working within have originated and where they've come from. So it's these fields of socially organized activity that make up these phenomena or what Smith calls the ruling relations, very complex webs of um, conceptual ruling that happens and influences and changes what happens at the front lines. So again, if we look at this picture here, if we're looking at this observation of a nurse and a patient and we're trying to understand what it is that's happening there and how it's organized to happen, we're able to identify that they're linked into the institution. And what happens in much research that's conducted is that we begin at that conceptual level. So we start by looking at the concepts that are already established. We look from the state uh, and we, we look down to see how it is that these concepts that have become part of the taken for granted understanding of the way healthcare is organized, and we look to see how those are impacting what's happening at the front lines. What institutional ethnography does, is it offers a way to look at what's happening without beginning within the same abstract theories and concepts through which people have come to know about a topic or a practice area. So instead, institutional, institutional ethnography researchers examine the technical terms, the professional language, or the jargon that form the institutional discourses from, from with, within which the work takes place. And the aim of IE is to explicate how these conceptual systems carry institutional purposes and reproduce specific aspects of the ruling relations. So in IE, and this is why um, Smith describes it as an alternative sociology, it begins from the experiential level of work at the front lines and looks up into the institution rather than stopping, uh, starting in the, <coughs> excuse me, the, <coughs> the organizational concepts and, and looking down to the front lines. Standpoint in institutional ethnography is about identifi identifying the place in the experiential world of work where the, the inquiry will begin. So it may be that it begins from the standpoint, in, in my case when I looked at uh, nurses working in outpatient wound clinics, I began from the standpoint of nurses and I interviewed nurses as the first um, step into understanding how this was organized. And again, what um, separates IE in many ways from some uh, qualitative methods is that the way that this is understood is by looking at the texts that are in place. So texts are a very important part of any uh, inquiry in institutional ethnography. At each of these areas that I've been um, talking about as we look up into the institution, there is always a textual organization of the work that is taking place. Texts in IE are not necessarily uh, paper documents, and I'll talk a little bit more about the other ways that texts are understood in IE. But in order to understand how it all works and how people's thoughts and actions are being coordinated, it's important to discover and to examine the texts that are in place that are organized in the way the work happens. So those at the front line 
are held accountable to institutional priorities carried by standard regulatory texts, both in the process of completing documents. So if you're asked to collect data about a patient um, in a healthcare situation, um, then you're asked to collect it in a certain way that we can empirically trace to identify how that fits within the discourses that are organizing the work to happen. And also through the work that collecting that data and understanding the patient in the way that that data organizes us to understand the patient, we're able to also see how that's organizing us to, to perform certain work in certain ways. So the social organization of people's language, ideas and actions in an institutional context can be made visible through empirically tracing the discourse embedded in the, te embedded in the texts. So by looking in the text for certain language, for particular terms that occur, for the, particularly for categories, if people are put into uh, categories, you can identify where those categories have been constructed from the discourse. So that brings us to the textual coordination of graduate work. And I have to say, this is not based on any um, empirical evidence that I've collected, but it's from my own experience of being a graduate student and of trying to explain what I've just explained to you, to oftentimes to committees that are very much organized by a textually organized structure that determines that we have to present graduate work in certain ways, that we have to approach graduate work in certain ways, that we have to demonstrate that what it is that we're doing fits within the discourse of graduate work. So there's the, um, this, this um, diagram is adapted from Dorothy Smith's diagram um, and uh, from her book, the 2006 book, Institutional Ethnography as Practice. And, um, she refers to this person here as a small hero looking up into the institution. And I'm sure graduate students here can identify with that uh, terminology that here you are looking up into the institution and trying to understand how it is that I'm going to be able to demonstrate what I'm doing in the way that I've been required to do. And of course, the discourses that we have happening around us, we have to find a supervisor who is going to relate to what it is that we want to explore, who's going to be able to understand and to be able to ask us questions in a way that um, enable us to be able to demonstrate how we're using institutional ethnography. I was extremely lucky when I did my um, doctoral work. Uh, Dr. Janet Rankin was my supervisor, a very accomplished institutional ethnographer who was able to guide me and to ask me questions. But I've worked with a lot of uh, graduate students. I've talked to a lot of graduate students who may be finding themselves on committees with people who haven't necessarily um, studied institutional ethnography and often struggle to, uh, to know what questions to ask. And in the same thing too, that the students um, very often, and I certainly was in that situation of not being to able to articulate what it was that I understood, and I'll explain a little bit more as I go through why that is a struggle often for students. Of course, we have to present whatever it is that we're doing to an ethics review board, and the documentation and what we're asked to present has to be presented in a particular way. We're all bound within the scientific method, which again organizes how we're expected to produce work and how we're expected to uh, demonstrate that we're meeting the criteria. University itself has its own institutional regime that we need to follow guidelines, we need to follow processes that um, demonstrate that we've been able to follow it. And up into, again, up into the government level, um, oftentimes funding when we're applying for funding as qualitative researchers. Um, it often becomes very complicated because a lot of the funding processes are set up very quantitatively and we're expected to demonstrate what it is we're doing within certain parameters. So certain questions pose some challenges for institutional ethnographers because using an, an alternative sociology that doesn't begin in theory can become quite complicated to be able to demonstrate that. What is your research question? fairly fundamental in most cases that you're expected to be able to answer this when you're writing a proposal or you'll be able, being able to present your work. I'll come back to all of these in a little while. How does the literature inform your project? Who are your participants? And what chapter are you currently writing? 
I was asked all of those questions at various points. So what is your research question? Again, if you're writing a proposal, most ethics boards, ethics review boards will be asking you to be able to clearly articulate what your research question is. Dorothy Smith, uh, when she was uh, developing institutional ethnography, one of the things that she talks about in her early days of coming to understand this work was that she was working as an academic, teaching sociology. She was also a wife and a mother, um, was raising children and um, doing everything that's involved with being a wife and mother. And what she found was that as a sociologist, when she arrived at the university, having rushed around and fed her kids and got them to appointments and done everything that's involved, she was expected to leave that knowledge, the embodied knowledge that she held of being a wife and a mother at the door of the university and to enter in and to move into what she called the head world of being in the university, where she was then expected to study the lives of wives and mothers through a conceptual lens that didn't necessarily fit what it was that she had been experiencing in her own personal situation. Smith calls this bifurcated consciousness, that, that, um, that way of knowing that often comes into conflict with the textually organized way in which we know our work. So this is in institutional ethnography rather than coming up with a predefined research question because in order to define a research question what you really need to do is go to the literature, look at the current concepts that are out there, understand what has already been talked about this area and then to come up with a research question that fits within those concepts that are already the taken for granted way of understanding that work. So in institutional ethnography, what we do instead is to begin in those moments when people, when what people are saying and what they're actually doing appear to be at odds. And this is what we begin to formulate is a, is a problematic. And this is just a quote that I have from uh, some of the data I collected in a wound clinic. And Debbie, who was one of the wound clinic registered nurses said, I mean, sometimes we try to guard the look of horror on our faces when we see a patient in February that was referred in November and has taken a major turn. And you think, sounding shocked, oh my God, it took you that long to get in? But then to the patient, you kind of say, sounding matter of fact, oh really, it took you that long to get in? And she laughs. So you can he see here that Debbie has a conflict between the way that she is experiencing this patient's um, concerns, she, uh, the, 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 in the bigger interview it was that the patient had deteriorated rapidly within this time and Deb, Debbie understood from the way that she had been um, taught and understood to know wound care that this patient, things may have been different if the patient had got in, different, got in at a different time, but she's conflicted here. She has, she's also uh, torn between her understanding of what she thinks may have been the right thing to do and what within the institution she's organized to present a different face to the patient than the one that is actually kind of running through her head. So I can begin to see that, that there's a conflict between these two different things, a moment of disjuncture, which just at this point begins to trouble me. I don't really know what is organizing this. I don't know why it is that this is happening, but I can see that there must be something beyond this situation that is organizing it to happen. So it gives me a clue or an idea that I can lead into the social organization of this event to start to look and see what may be organizing it. So again, if I'm starting at the beginning, I'm gonna be tracing those arrows up into the institution. So what I need to look for in that, uh, that extract from, a, from an interview and from all of my data is those doors into the institution. Where is it that I'm seeing disjunctures that may lead me in? I don't know which direction they're going to take me, but I know that it's going to give me some information about what may be organizing that event to happen. So collecting data often in institutional ethnography is done through observation and interviews. Um, there is no um, formula for doing institutional ethnography. Many people have approached data in many different ways. So I'm going to, just for the purposes of this, talk about my own um, way of approaching observations and interviews, but it's not necessarily um, that everybody will be doing 
uh, the same data collection. One of the reasons that I did observations and interviews is that that then helps you to understand these disjunctures. So I observed nurses, I watched what it was that I was seeing them doing in their interactions with patients, with family members, with other people. I noticed where they were interacting with others and then when I interviewed them and I was able to pick up those disjunctures between what it was that they were telling me they were doing and what it was that I had actually observed them doing in their place of work. So this is another extract here. So Elaine was uh, one of the clinic nurses and when Elaine removed the dressing from the wound, Mrs. Noble, one of the patients, pulled her face. She tells Elaine she doesn't like to look at it and her family tells her it's disgusting. Elaine nods as she uses a paper ruler to measure the height and width of the wound. She compares these figures to the previous dimensions recorded on the wound care pathway, which is the document where the nurses were recording their observations of the wounds. Although Elaine hasn't seen the wound before, she reassures Mrs. Noble that it's smaller than on her last visit, so things are going as planned. Mrs. Noble sighs with relief as every little bit is encouraging. Now there's various ways I could look at that, uh, that um, piece of data, and I could look at it and I could make some kind of judgment if I just look at the data that I'm faced with there, and I could think, Okay, this patient is telling the nurse all about the things in her life that are impacting her ability to heal this wound. She's telling her that it's, it's, um, her family's disgusted by it. And at other points in the interview, she tells Elaine that she's not able to get to the visit because of other things that are happening, such as her son had had surgery and she wasn't be able to get a ride to the appointments and she wasn't able to be there on time. And I can also see that the nurse apparently is ignoring a lot of this and focusing on the wound and not in any way interacting with the patient about the circumstances of her life that she's trying to tell her about. So was I just to look at this, it may be that I would think perhaps negatively about the nurse and think as a nurse who tells me that what she's delivering is patient-centered care, which is what many of the nurses uh, talked about, I'm not seeing this in practice and why is that happening and I may keep it at that place and see. But what I do as an institutional ethnographer is to look at this and to see where can I see doors into the social organisation of what is happening here. Where is it that things beyond this situation may be contributing to what it is that I see. So Elaine removes the dressing. What, I, the, what question that asks me or what I ask of the interview is how does Elaine know to remove a dressing? Where did she get the information from that says that she needs to remove that dressing? What education does she have? What kind of text is behind the fact that she knows that that's what she needs to do during that visit? Elaine uses a paper ruler to measure the height and the width. Why is that important? Why is it that what Elaine does, her activities during the clinic visit, is to measure the height and the width of the wound. Why does that become the priority that she, she chooses to do during the visit? I see that she records the information, the dimensions that she's collected on the wound care clinical pathway, so I know that this pathway is a text that is gonna lead me into the social organization of what's happening in this visit. I know that there is something behind that document that is organizing Elaine to collect certain data and to do certain things during the visit. She also tells Mrs. Noble that her wound is smaller than on her last visit, so things are going as planned. How do we know what the plan is? Where does the information come from that says that things are progressing in a particular way and how does Elaine know what it is that she's expecting to see at that point? And I also notice in this, in the blue ones, that the patient is also working in this situation. The patient is working to explain to Elaine the impact that this wound has on her life. She's explaining to her that she has issues and she has problems that this wound is causing, but she's also relieved when Elaine tells her that it is going according to plan and she's presenting herself in a particular way to say, that she's really pleased that every little bit is encouraging. 
And again, this is part of a much bigger interview where the, the patient continues to present herself in a way that is either apologizing for the fact that she's not able to follow the plan that the nurse has, um, is, is talking about, or that she is presenting herself to say that she is following the plan. And every patient that I interviewed or every, every uh, nurse that I interviewed and every patient observa observation that I conducted, the patients were always working to present themselves in ways that either demonstrated that they followed the plan or if they didn't, they then became labeled as non-compliant or as troublemakers to the system. And what happens here is I can trace back when I look, start to look at the plan and what it is that um, is organized in the visit in time-wise, I can trace it back to best practice guidelines that demonstrate that if Elaine takes certain actions, that wound will be expected to heal. So again, during I'm not only co um, collecting observations and interviews, but I'm also identifying any texts that are either referred to or are actually physically used during the observations and the interviews. And there's many of them. The first interview that I ever uh, conducted in this study, I came away afterwards, went through a list. I had 51 documents that had either been used during the interview or were referred to at some point. So it becomes very complex to try and determine which ones of those are significant, which ones am I going to trace into the institution. So again, Answering the question of who will my participants be before I start is a really difficult um, thing to do because what I want to do is identify where the work that I'm observing is connected to other people in the organization and I want to speak to those people as well that are connected in some way or other to the observation to understand how their work is organized and how it is that the information either they're passing on to the, uh, the situation I'm looking at or the information that is being collected from that situation and passed on to somebody else so that the sequence of events can continue, I need to know how those people's work is organized too. So until I've collected some data and I've identified those links into the organization, I'm not able to say up front who it is that I need to speak to next. So institutional ethnographies are rarely planned out fully in advance. Instead, the process of inquiry is rather like grabbing a ball of string finding a thread and then pulling it out. And that's why it's difficult to specify in advance what the research will consist of. And for those of you that are institutional ethnography students, this is a great quote to put in when you're trying to demonstrate why it is that you can't say uh, what it is that you're gonna do ahead of time. So what do you do with the data once you've collected it? Because you've got all this information and you've, you've collected, uh, as I said in my case, interviews and observations. I've got a lot of doors into the social. How do I know which one to follow? How do I know where to go? This is how it feels. That ball of string suddenly becomes this huge, unwieldy, um, complex data. As I said, 51 documents mentioned in one interview. Where do I start? Which of those documents do I trace? So we've got uh, time constraints too. And where do you actually go and which thread do you follow? So this is at this point, once you've already collected data, that you need to define where you're going to move beyond the primary informants. So who are you going to speak to next? Where are you going to move to? Which of those threads are you going to follow? And it may be that you follow it into a particular direction. So for example, in the interview with Debbie where she had talked about how this patient had arrived, had been scheduled to come at some, at, in February I think it was, and ended up coming in November. Who was it that determined at that time who, how the scheduling process was going to take place? So I decide that I'm gonna follow the thread that looks at scheduling and how is that going to um, how, how is their work understood and organized textually? So here again is another um, extract. So Barbara, one of the wound clinic nurses said, for myself personally, I always feel like I can't quite get a handle on everything. It's because my clients might be seen by other clinic staff and I don't even know who they are. They've been put on my caseload like this, but then I don't get a report from anybody necessarily. They may even be seen and discharged before I even know that I have them. 
So looking at this, I can see doors into the social again within this. I know that Barbara's work is not happening in isolation. She's connected to other clinic staff. So there are other people that she's working with that I may need to interview and I may need to talk to to understand how this situation may have arisen. They've been put on my caseload. I want to know who does, who's they? Who is it that is putting patients onto a caseload? What do we mean by a caseload? How is a caseload organized? How do I trace that textually into the organization to understand how Barbara is um, re recalling this? And in this case, she says, I don't get a report. So there isn't a text there. She, she's, she's actually saying that there's a text missing. But again, I can trace it through and I can look to see what information is it that Barbara wishes she had got? What is it that, how is it that she understands to know her work and what is happening here? And in fact, what happened when I started to trace these through and I talked to the person that organized the caseload management, I understood that theoretically within the health region where this was conducted, case management was a relatively new concept that had been introduced and that patients were expected to be case, mani case managed in as much as there was somebody responsible for that patient's navigation through the healthcare system. But what had happened was that every job had been divided into either case management or intervention and wounds had been designated as an intervention. Except if the patient only had a wound, in which case the nurses in the wound clinic then became case managers because every patient had to have a case manager in order to fit within the healthcare system. So what was happening was theoretically, and again, had I started in the concept of case management and looked to see how this was happening through a case management lens, I may have been able to justify that what was happening did in fact fit with the theoretical concepts of case management. But by starting in what I was observing and listening to the nurses speaking about, I traced it back and I understood that in fact this had become problematic because wounds were seen as a task that could be done to a patient, the case manager held all the information about the patients, held all of that background information, held all of the knowledge about, well, not all of the knowledge, they held knowledge about the patient situation. That was not transferred to the wound clinic because the wound clinic had been designated as interventionists. And so if we go back to those um, interviews where and the observations where every patient was trying to explain to the nurse how compl complex these wounds were in their lives, the nurses had only been given a very short period of time in order to change a dressing, get the patient um, fixed and get them out of there um, because that's how their work had been presented. So textually the wound documents that they were creating that said that the priority was to measure a wound to see how how much smaller it had got them previously was organizing their ability to be able to attend to the other needs of the patients. Oh, these are just my little pictures of all the things I collected there. So there's the other people in the institution. There's my ball of string leading me textually into the other organization. And again, being able to trace it from the experiential world of work up into the discourse. So the discourses I have up here are integrated care and patient-centered care. And again, had I started there and tried to justify what it was I was seeing through the theoretical lens, I may have been able to say, in fact, that what, what, that's what was happening. But starting experientially, I saw a very different picture emerging. So this brings us back to how does the literature inform your project? Another question that uh, is often asked and we're expected when we're writing a proposal or when we're presenting work to be able to demonstrate how it is that we've read the literature, identified gaps in the current research and to be able to articulate what it is that we're going to be building on work that has previously happened. This of course becomes problematic in institutional ethnography because that whole um, textual organization of work often stems from the literature, the evidence that is being used um, to create many of the documents that are organized in the work is the evidence base, the, the knowledge base from that particular area of practice. 
So in institutional ethnography, we do what we call reading for the social. When I look at an article, and of course we do read the evidence, look at the evidence, want to understand what it is that is socially organized in the work to take place, and to understand the evidence in a way that doesn't necessarily begin in the theoretical concepts. So what I do when I read an article is to look at that background. I always go straight to this piece here. There's always a background piece in an article that uh, very often will say something that gives you many clues to the discursive organization of the work. And it will establish, for example, that integrated care is the way that we need to move forward in healthcare. And if I read a sentence like that, I've already got an understanding that whoever's writing this article is coming from the discourse and the article has likely been compiled in a way that is going to demonstrate that whatever theoretical concept has been talked about in the abstract or in the background is then going to be confirmed within what's written in the article. The other thing I like to look at is the acknowledgements, who's sponsoring the paper, what organization have they come from, what institutional background do they have, what is it that is behind the theoretical concepts that are here, and what may be organizing those to happen. If somebody has, been, has received funding from an organization that expects them to present literature in a particular way or present evidence in a particular way, then I s expect that that's what I'm going to see in the paper is that the evidence has been presented in the way that has enabled them to receive the funding that they're going to receive. All of these are doors into the social organization of the evidence that's contained in here, and I want to know how that evidence has then been taken up and informing practice. So this is probably the most challenging thing, certainly that I experienced, um, as an institutional ethnographer, and particularly as somebody studying my own area of expertise. So, as you heard in my introduction, I have a master's in wound healing and tissue repair that I, um, that I completed through a school of medicine, uh, very, um, in many ways, biomedical approach to the care of people living with chronic wounds. Uh, that was the area that I tended to focus on in that area. So I thought I knew a lot about wounds. I was considered to be a wound care expert. And one of the troubling things that took me into this doctoral work in the first place was the fact that very often people would send me pictures of wounds. And they would say, send me an email, hey, Nikki, got this wound, what do I do with it? And it was troubling to me because as a nurse and as somebody who works uh, with people and, and, and spend a lot of my um, practical, my clinical work working in community, I understood that a wound never happens in a picture. It always has a patient attached to it. I've never seen one yet that doesn't. Um, and I want to know way more about it than just the wound. But as a wound care expert, I was expected to be able to diagnose and treat that wound just from a picture. This was troubling to me, and it was, as I said, what brought me into it. But what happened as I started to observe and interview people was that I realized I came to the understanding that how I had learned to do wound care and how I knew to do wound work was in fact part of this conceptual practice of separating wounds and abstracting them from the patient. That I had been part of processes that developed tools for measuring wounds and for seeing where the wounds had got smaller and all of the things that I observed. And one of the things that was became complicated was that when I was trying to interview people, because there's not that many of us that are wound care experts, it's hard to be anonymous in this. Many people know that that's what it is I do. So when I'm trying to interview people, they would say, oh, you know, Nikki, you know what's going on. I don't need to explain that to you. And as an institutional ethnographer, part of my learning to interview people was to be able to say, I know you think I know, but can you tell me what it is that you know about this? And it wasn't until I was able to do that and I was able to have people articulate to me in the words and the language that I began to realize not only how, how much I had been part of that process and how much I'd been part of learning to do wound care conceptually, but also to understand that it, 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 was, it was just really difficult for me in many ways to, to, um, to be able to 
separate myself from the fact, and, and, but also to be able to see that I then had doors into the social that may be part of the solution or at least part of ways of being, op being able to open dialogue about what it is that we're doing in ways that we can move forward. And in fact, we've been doing that in wound care, um, looking a little more about the evidence and how have we collected evidence and how we're going to move forward with the evidence that we are collecting. So I'll just touch on these briefly here, but this is an institutional circuit which, which is... Uh, a, a, way, a way of understanding some of the concepts that I've been talking about here, about starting in the theory, and very often when we do start with a theoretical concept, the work that we then, or the evidence and the work that we then produce, is produced in a way that is intended to perpetuate the theory that we decided in the first place. So the circuit can be made visible through ethnographic description of the work, work taking place. So rather than an abstracted interpretation, you can empirically trace the ways people are working to create a depiction of what they're doing that fits within the categories and criteria of a regulatory text. So when the nurses were collecting data about the sizes of wounds, that was how they had been taught to prioritize the particular aspects of the wound and of the patient that would fit within institutional categories that were determined by evidence that said if a wound is getting smaller, it must be getting better. And in certain situations that works, but as we, w as we work more with chronic wound patients, we understand that in many cases, wounds may not heal. They may, they may end up being maintenance wounds. If you've got a patient that's palliative, for example, they're not going to fit within that category because our aim is not to heal the wound. But almost all of the wound work that we're expected to do is based on criteria that say if you measure a wound and it's not getting smaller, there is some kind of problem with the system. And this would be what we would consider to be an institutional circuit that says that we need to heal wounds and we need to produce evidence that we are healing wounds. And an accountability circuit takes that one step further where having established an institutional circuit and established ways of working that fit within that institutional circuit, people are then held accountable for how well they're doing their work based with on the content of that institutional circuit. So people are expected to collect data in ways that demonstrate that what they're doing fits within that institutional circle. And accountability is it's created when individuals conducting frontline work are assessed as competent or otherwise through their ability to amass data based on the objective categories and concepts of the institutional circuits. So what came out very clearly in the work that I was doing when I was interviewing um, and observing nurses in the wound clinics was that patients who came to the clinic and who did not present themselves in particular ways of following best practice evidence or of doing what it is that they had been asked to do, bearing in mind that the nurses didn't weren't organized to have time to collect the information about all the other things that were happening in their lives. They could only assess this patient's ability to follow the guidelines that they were given within the time they were there. These patients then became labeled as troublemakers and as non-compliant with the information that had been, they had been given, despite the fact that every patient I was seeing was trying to explain why it was that they weren't able to do that. But the nurses as interventionists were not organized to be able to, to, um, to act on that information. The other thing too is that the nurses are held accountable on their ability to be able to do this. So the nurses um, talked at length about the fact that they were told that what they had to do was treat a patient within 20 minutes. They had to collect the information, um, make sure that the wound was healing and smaller and move that patient on through the system. Those nurses who opted to spend more time with patients and talk to them and collect more information were actually held accountable to management for being ones that were disrupting the system and reducing the effect effectiveness and the efficiency of the running of the clinic. 
and that uh, came to light too. So nurses were being held within the accountability circuits. So very briefly here, because I know I'm getting <laughs> close to the end of time, but this, as I moved into the institution and um, began to talk to the manager, what I wanted to understand as I moved um, further into the institution, into those layers that I talked about, was how it was that nurses had nurses' work had been um, reduced and the timing of clinic visits was constantly being reduced um, based on the evidence that they were producing. So when I talked to the manager, she let me know that there were certain protocols, uh, there were certain timelines that appeared in guidelines that said if something is not changing within a particular period of time, this is how we know whether or not a nurse has been successful in working with this wound patient. And I'm not going to go into this in too much depth, except to say that this also opened doors into the social to understand how the manager's work was also being organized textually in ways that uh, identified certain categories, such as the two weeks of care was a, was a category that kept coming up over and over again, that if something hasn't happened within two weeks, then certain, a certain sequence of events needed to occur. So what I wanted to do was trace and see where did this two weeks come from and how was it that that was changing what the nurses could do at the front lines. So once I had collected this information and I had a clearer picture of how it was that nurses' work was organized and uh, many of these uh, levels of discourse that which, uh, were organizing what they were doing, what I did was then I went back to the front lines and I looked to see when I revisited my interviews and my observations to see whether I could then see evidence of these discourses that were appearing in the observations and the interviews that I'd conducted. And it was possible to see and to explicate how many of the, the issues and the disjunctures that the nurses had described to me when I talked to them were in fact able to be shown to be happening because of the way that the, the discourses were entering into and organizing their work. So I think, yep, that's the last slide I had there. <laughs>